Hey, before we get into this episode of Tales from the Rabbit Hole, I want to give a little bit of context and a little scene setting and a few little warnings. The guest today is Gary Voorhis, who is a witness to the 2004 Nimitz UFO encounter. Now, Gary says he saw the UFO in a number of ways. He saw it visually with his own eyes through binoculars. He saw radar returns of various uh, UFOs, and he saw a videotape of the uh, the UFO incident, famously referred to as the Tic Tac uh, video. I believe that Gary is telling the truth and that uh, he believes exactly what he is saying and he's you know, not, not lying. Uh, I don't believe, though, that it is some kind of physics-defying advanced technology that he saw. And so that's really the baseline context of this interview in that I'm very skeptical about Gary's interpretation of what he saw, even though I believe that he thinks he saw what he thinks, says he saw. So this interview is about me trying to understand what Gary might have seen, trying to figure out if it does have some kind of mundane explanation. If it doesn't have some kind of mundane explanation, then how do we verify that? How can we tell uh, that it is actually something very unusual? Warnings. The discussion gets a little bit technical at times and perhaps might be a little bit boring to people who aren't really that interested in UFOs or things like radars. And there's also a little bit of background noise, which can be a little bit distracting. But if it's a topic that you're interested in, or if you're just interested in a different type of conspiracy theory, the theory that the government is covering up uh, alien encounters, then you might find it interesting. Okay, let's get on with the show. Welcome to Tales from the Rabbit Hole. My guest today is Gary Voorhis. Gary is uh, one of the Navy eyewitnesses to the famous Tic Tac UFO incident of 2004. He's also Vice President of UAP Expeditions, which is a non-profit set to provide testing services for technology to uh, detect UFOs, also called UAPs. And so we're going to talk about uh, the Tic Tac incident, and we're going to talk about what, uh, what Gary's doing now. So, Gary, welcome to Tales from the Rabbit Hole. Hey, thanks for having me. Thank you very much for doing this. I know you've been on a, a few podcasts and whatnot recently, so uh, thanks for doing my little little podcast here, little, little corner of the internet. I usually don't turn down too many of them because it's like a, not really into it for the money or anything like that. Just, you know, for me, I, I want to get as many people thinking about it as many people, you know, angles. You never know where you're going to find your next clue. So, you know, the more the merrier for me. So I know you've gone over it a bunch of times before, but probably for people who are listening to my podcast who aren't familiar with all the details, let's just kind of set the scene as to what this Tic Tac, uh, Tic Tac UFO incident actually was. Uh, it's back in November 2004. Is that right? Yeah, that's correct. I'll, I'll go over like a, a brief synopsis. Okay. There's plenty of places they can go into detail yeah, and get yeah. the the nitty gritty of it. But uh, basically in 2004, uh, the USS Princeton and the Nimitz battle group were tracking unknown aircraft for over seven days. And then at the end of that seven days, we did an F-18 interrogation and we've got a lot of pilots and we've got quite a few people that got to get up and close and personal with these objects. And now uh, we're just trying to figure out what the hell they were. Yeah. Back then, what was the first that you personally heard of uh, of what was going on? Um, so, I mean, the first thing that I heard was I went up to smoke and, you know, one of the guys that works on that radar said that, uh, you know, they, they had an unknown track and we'd have to probably recalibrate and bring the systems down later. And it basically, we just had to make sure that uh, there were no malfunctions or anything like that because we've got... Because it's our system. We, we, you know, if mm -hmm. we go tell the captain we got an unknown aircraft, we best damn well be sure that it's the real deal. Because that's, you know, it's kind of something you don't really just want to say, oh, yeah, well, by the way, we, you know, we've got unknown crafts we're tracking. You know, yeah. it's, 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 it's like, okay, well, what are they? Well, that's, they're, they're unknown. Yeah. <laughs> so it's like, uh, then it didn't fit any real profiles other than like, uh, at first, you know, at first glance, they're going real slow. They're not really doing anything crazy. So we're just kind of like, yeah, maybe, you know, we got some system clutter or something. And, mm -hmm. you know, and, and you know, no, no matter what resolution we went through, no matter what we did while it was up and running, you know, we still always had these tracks. And so we got permission from the captain to go ahead and 
take these systems down for a small duration, recalibrate the system, bring it back up. And sure enough, they're still there, you know, and so w- without 100% doubt, we, we have a solid radar track of these unknown objects and they're only doing like 100 knots. So we're just like scratching our heads like, what the heck are these? Um, yeah. It was kind of like a ongoing joke for a little bit because it was just like they weren't doing anything. They weren't doing any aggressive posturing. They were just 100 knots, same direction. You know, we track them, they disappear. We track them again, they disappear. Um, and then, you know, this kind of went on and off for days until we, we got the word that there was going to be an interrogation. Now, the first day I heard that it was going to be an interrogation, nothing happened that day. It was the next day that I was like, all right, yeah, they're doing an interrogation because they were going to do flight. They were going to be doing exercises out there. So they got, they're going to actually task these people to go see what the hell these are. Right. So for a few days, you were basically just observing them on the radar, and there were these tracks that were going south, I believe, at about 100 knots, which is 115 yeah. miles an I hour. Mean, for all intents and purposes, they just weren't really doing anything at first. Yeah. And so whenever we get within 70 miles or so of them, I'd always try to get a bearing of at least one of the targets, and whatever, which one's the closest. And I would try to go and see it. And sometimes I could see it, sometimes I couldn't. But it would be like uh, when you're at the beach and you see, you know, you know, there's a ship on the horizon, mm-hmm. but you don't know what kind of ship it is. You know, it could be a sailboat, it could be a tanker, it could be, you know, anything. But you know, there's a ship there. Could you see how? Could get any sense of how big it was from that distance? I did honest. No, honestly, I was just excited to be able to actually actually see something at the same bearing and the same place that it's supposed to be mm-hmm. you know because i mean you know just like you were saying before if if this wasn't a real object then you know i'd go up there and there just would never be anything there or there would be something that didn't resemble what we were tracking in any way shape or form but that we ended up having it where whatever the bearing is i was looking at it may have been too far when i couldn't see it and during the day it was a lot harder to see them than at night um they didn't the, like the because it's daylight you couldn't see kind of that phosphorescent glow that they had um but at night you could definitely see them so at night no matter what as long as we were close enough i could see them you couldn't make out detail you just know it was there you could see you could see where it is it'd be the, at the exact bearing that we would be checking on the radar i'd be going back and forth just to make sure i'm still looking at the right one for me it was a game you know i can i can i see it can i repeat it And I was trying to use the scientific method. You know, I was trying to make sure that everything I did could be repeatable. And if it's not, why? You know, if it's at the same bearing, same distance, why can't I still see it during the day? Why can't I see it at night? You know, if I could see it at night, why can't I see it during the day? Well, it it turns out it ends up being like, uh, because it's shadowed from the light of the sun during the day, it's it's dark. Mm -hmm. So there'll be like a little speck on the horizon. At night, because it actually has an internal glow to it, you could see it relatively easier, and you could see it for a further distance. Interesting. So, how how far away would it be? Like when you were seeing it at, at night as a, a light, roughly no more than eighty miles. Eighty uh, you, miles, it, yeah. it'd be, which is quite a distance. But you know, using those big eyes, you can you can really you know see quite a ways away. Could you see it at all with the naked eye, like when it was a speck of light on the in the distance? If you had real good vision, you might be able to see just a speck, but you wouldn't even, you know, you couldn't tell it from difference from anything background unless you were looking through the big eyes. I wish we had gotten a little closer and I got yeah. a better look at them. That would have been more, much more interesting to even talk about. But, you know, it was just nice that I could actually apply something to it, you know, say, all right, so... I know for a fact that the relative bearing and altitude is this direction and it should be right here. Then I'd take my sextant and I'd look and I'd say, all right, is it right here? Okay. It's there's something there. It's okay. So we have an object there. So, I mean, for me, it didn't really take rocket science to realize that these were real objects. And then, uh, what blew my mind was when I heard, uh, Commander Fravor's first interview about what they looked like. Yeah, and then in my mind, see, now I saw the video of the interrogation, and then him talking about it. 
And it was like, yeah, it's spot on, guy. The only things that were exaggerated in his story was some of the the Navy stuff, not the not the actual intercept and stuff like that, which is pretty impressive because I thought for sure he would exaggerate more, but he, he really didn't exaggerate a whole lot on the actual interrogation part. Mm-hmm. Um, it wasn't until like the the meetings and the people he knows and stuff like that. And I can't validate any of that stuff. So, and I'm not important enough to know any of those people. So, <laughs> yeah. So Fravor is the pilot who first went out to try to intercept uh, these, this, the interrogation, I guess it's like where you go out and you see what it is. Yeah. He, he was, he was the uh, pilot tasked to intercept. So, so why, so at the start, you've got these, these tracks on the radar and then you, you know, you think that they're, they're clutter and then you recalibrate things and then you, you realize that there are, they're real planes or you think that they're real planes or real craft of some sort. sort. Why isn't that a, a big deal immediately? Are these crafts like outside the area? You also have to remember that a lot of that area is still civilian airspace. Mm. Unless we're running a flight ops and we're keeping people out of a specific area, you, you could have people drift in. Say, say somebody was hot air ballooning and they just drifted off the coast. Mm. <laughs> I mean, it would be a pretty big deal if we decided to shoot down a hot air balloon. Yeah. You know, granted, they're not going to do 100 knots. That's a little fast for a hot air balloon. But, you know, and with a good tailwind, I mean, they, they could possibly get up over 100 knots. Yeah, but, I think uh, the wind, uh, what out, it was like 28,000 feet, wasn't it? Yeah, it, initially, they kind of stuck around that altitude for the yeah. most part. And it wasn't until the interrogation that they start kind of going a little nuts. So uh, you see these these tracks on the radar now. Kevin Day, who's the the radar operator, essentially, uh, a, he he says that he sees them dropping out of the sky from high altitude to low altitude, very very rapidly. Is that something yeah. that was observed like early on, or was that something in in no? Like the- no honestly, until the interrogation, they generally just were benign. I mean, literally. Mm. I mean, that's probably why everything was went the way it did. But even though, you know, I still, you know, at the time we were still kind of wondering why isn't the chain of command, you know, a little bit more worried about this, especially since, you know, we realized that they're not balloons, you know, there ain't balsa wood gliders just sitting up there at, you know, <laughs> gliding along, you know. Um, so, I mean, it was just like everybody was just waiting because, I mean, you know, if they stayed there long enough, eventually they're going to send something. But there, I think there might have been two factors in play. The fact that they weren't, there was no hostile intentions, meaning they didn't do any like active radar jamming on us. I'm not, I, I haven't really heard whether it was any of the jets actually got jammed or not. I think Fravor said he was being jammed, but I'd have to go back and look. I, I, I've, I've seen so many different things about what Fravor said and what he hasn't said. But as for like, my aspect, I know that our radar could see them clear as day, regardless of what they were doing. And they weren't doing any hostile posturing. They weren't heading directly towards our ships. You know, um, generally when somebody tries to target you, they use a concentrated burst of RF to locate your, you know, to paint you. Mm -hmm. And that's how they would, you know, that's what they call painting the target. You know, so there was no active tracking on us so that you know, we would, so there was no hostile intentions. So with that close to civilian airspace, you know, we don't want to be the guys that shot down another bus. <laughs> so. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It's just, it's just so interesting though. That, uh, I think that the thing a lot of people don't really understand about the case is this kind of almost like a lack of concern from the, the higher ups. And it would really would seem like that. Does it seem like they know something that you don't know? Either they know something that we don't know, or you got to remember that something like this could possibly be a career ender for an officer. You know, a grunt like me, we don't care. I mean, what are they going to do? Take a stripe? No. Mm. But with a, with a captain, he's looking. I know that particular captain was very a go getter, definitely trying to make his next rank. It, it could, you know, it could mar your record. And you, you'll be the, oh, you're the guy that tracked uh, aliens, you know, and they'll just ridicule you. 
<laughs> you know, it doesn't matter whether they're just unknown aircrafts. You know, it doesn't matter that. I mean, if the captain took it serious, like after uh, I tell you, I guarantee you, after the interrogations, they were taking it serious because mm-hmm. these ships outflew us. You know, they, they could just fly around us and do whatever they wanted in any speed, direction, velocity. You know, the jets just couldn't right. keep up with that kind of a, a, a agile maneuvering. But initially, though, you just had these targets that were like, what, like 70 miles away or something, and they were just... They, they varied mileage, because you got to remember, we can, we can see 256 nautical miles around each ship. Yeah. So that's, that's, that's the horizon. So, you know, as they come within that type of range, spy radar is very powerful. So within that, with that, within that zone of influence, we can see everything. Let's talk a little bit about the radar because like it's I think people don't really understand you know what type of radar we're talking about here like the spy one radar uh, it's it's not like the little rotating thing yeah, so when people think of radars they think of the the parabolic dish that rotates and you know sends out a pulse and then it rotates and it picks the pulse back up and you know so that that's actually a very slow radar versus mm-hmm. what ours is so like. If you look up a early Burke destroyer or an eight or, or a cruiser, you'll see these hexagonal panels on four sides of the ship. Now, those panels contain feed horns, hundreds of feed horns. Each one of these feed horns can be directed independently. Technically, they can all hold a track individually, but they, they're used in, in sequence to provide a 360 degree sweep of real time radar around the entire ship. It's, it's, it's a crazy tech piece of tech that, you know, honestly, it's, it impressed me from day one, how this thing worked. And I remember when I first got to see up underneath the, uh, cause that, that, that thing is just a cover that you see. And then mm-hmm. there's, there's stuff underneath it. Yeah, I can And imagine. you know, it's, 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 it's crazy how it looks because it's just this like electronic field and you can kind of see uh, how it's modular on the inside. And, um, each one of those feed corns can be replaced. And even if one got damaged or jammed, all the rest would still work just fine, which is, you know, poses a lot of the problem with, um, spoofing this type of radar because, mm-hmm you basically would have to spoof every individual feed horn, which it, it would be next to impossible to do that. Even, even with an advanced technology, you know, far above ours, it would be pretty amazing to be able to spoof that kind of radar. And it's not, not a matter of like physics or anything like that. It's just a matter of numbers. Well, I mean, yeah, you're going to be able to spoof maybe one or two feed horns, but you're not going to be able to spoof the whole thing. And then because of the way the system works, say two feed horns are getting some anomalous reading, it'll ignore it and it won't show it. And then yeah. basically our ORT system would say, hey, no, that's that's not that's not right. And then it would just ignore it. I guess the so the, the, the spy radar has essentially like a big computer that takes these signals and then converts them into pictures. It's not like the, the old ones where it was like a direct. And you're talking to the guy that used to run that computer. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You're the, uh, I heard you were the, the only it guy on the, uh, or the only computer tech on the, on the ship. Yeah. I was the only computer tech on the ship. Uh, the ship went to baseline six, one in during docking period. So between a couple of guys kind of getting, uh, let go from the service under, not so great circumstances before our last deployment. It land, landed me one of the only computer technicians on board because they went from a, a old, uh, you know, back wiring. You know, honestly, they went from like 60s technology to hmm. caught off the shelf technology. And they basically hybridized our ship. Our ship was like a bastard hybrid of old tech and new tech. And so we had all these caught off the shelf systems half the system was run with that stuff and the other half was run with the old proprietary systems. Sounds like a uh, IT fan getting all that stuff working together. No, what was fun is, is uh, making sure every fiber splice was, was good. Really? <laughs> well, I, the guy that the, the guy in the shipyard that was doing the, uh, the nodes, you know, they got these big bell housings with these mm-hmm. fiber nodes in them. And they're right. just, you know, thousands of connections inside these things. And, uh, I mean, the first time we we lit them up with a laser, it looked like a disco. (laughs) So I don't know if that guy was drunk, whatever. 
Yeah, I think people don't really realize just how much computer tech there is on ships nowadays. Uh, and, you know, just in, in all aspects of the military, it's like very, getting very, very heavy in terms you of... You thought that was awesome. You should see the specs on the DD-21. That thing is a technological nightmare when it comes to being a computer technician on board. I can imagine. And I imagine you have much stricter standards than industry in, in, in some ways uh, because, you know, there's lots of things that are people's lives depend on, upon it. Well, people on the ship's lives depend on all those systems. Yeah. Uh, I mean, us fire controlmen, I mean, that entire ship's built around us. Everything about that ship is for missile defense, for fighting. It is a fighting ship. Yeah. And so everything is, is every, every system on that ship, it was built around the fire control systems, around the Aegis weapon system. You know, so everything ties in. Right. And fire control, uh, you know, it sounds like you're talking about like putting out fires, but fire control is about controlling the firing of things. We put it pretty simple because a lot of people make that mistake and say, okay, well, I was a fire controlman. I didn't put fires out. I made them. Yeah. Yes. Okay. <laughs> so like part of the whole te computer technology is the, uh, what, what they call the CEC, which is uh, Cooperative Engagement Capability. Yeah, cooperative engagement capability. So the so now I can talk about primary duties on the system. I can't talk about system specifics or like sure. how the recording works or you know anything like that. I can tell you that the recording is tied into the actual hard disk. So that's the reason why they had to actually wipe that entire hard disk to get rid of the data off of that because the operating system for it and its space for it's it, where, where it stored all of this information was it was on the same disk and it was not partitioned. Right. So it was, you know, if it, if it had been partitioned, you, you know, we could have probably saved that data and or just deleted the data they wanted, kept the operating system on. But that's the only reason why that that was wiped. Um, yeah. So you're kind of jumping ahead a little bit there. This is kind sorry, of I'm getting uh, too many, too many uh, Twitter. Uh, conversations you guys are killing me with that stuff oh my god it was so yeah, hard yeah. to keep track of what they were saying <laughs> yeah there's a lot of people uh, chiming in on uh, on twitter on the uh, uh, I, 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 I tried to kind of rein it in a little bit but it's you know you can only rein it in so far um people get very um very passionate about this topic uh the the ufo topic like uh, i read i read a ironically there's a, a fantasy novel called uh, the sword of truth series that has this uh phrase in it that says Everybody will believe anything as long as they either fear it'll be true or they want it to be true. And I, mm. I feel that that actually holds a lot of truth in this field because you've got people like yourself that are, you know, very skeptical of these things. You have people like, you know, other people that are just absolute true believers. I could tell them that, you know, I found a leprechaun and, you know, sorry, I couldn't get any film. But, you know, they'll sit there and just listen to the story all day long when I never actually did any of that. And and then, you know, you admit, OK, well, I didn't see find a leprechaun. And they're like, oh, you got me, you know, then then again, you, you have both sides of that house. So I try to I fall somewhere in between. I'm an absolute skeptical believer, meaning that if I hadn't seen these things, I wouldn't believe that they existed. Let's talk about the, the, the tape uh, that, you, that you saw like when. Uh... Commander Fravor went out and he did an interrogation and he saw things and he came back and then another plane went out uh, with Chad Underwood, I think is the name of the pilot. And he he took video. And this is the famous video that uh, you know, has been on the news and everything. And it shows uh, it's pretty grainy and low resolution and it, and it shows a, uh, a, a dark dot in the distance, essentially. And uh, it kind of moves around as the camera moves around. And there's some dispute as to whether it's actually moving or whether it's the camera moving. I, um, I actually think it's uh, more the plane jerking around and moving um, at first. Uh, but that when that thing hauls ass towards the end mm -hmm. of the video, that was an actual thing. Because actually it hauls ass out of the frame and then it comes back into the frame. And when you saw, uh, well... Well, we'll just say that due to certain aspects of the film itself and its originality, you could tell that the, the plane was staying on the same bearing. Right. Um, because you got to remember the original film has 
all the information along the edges of its bearing, its azimuth, its angles, the, the way that the plane, plane's flying. So mm -hmm. that's how they can tell whether or not, you know, it's the object moving out of the frame or the frame moving out of the uh, away from the object. But yeah, I've I've spent a lot of time looking at that, and I, you know, obviously I haven't seen the the original. I'm just seeing you know what's on the internet. And I tend to think that it's the camera moving, not the plane moving or the object moving, but the, the camera itself. The camera uh, did have the ability to move also. Yeah. yeah, but the camera like it's also it's it switches between like the infrared and the TV mode. And it also yeah, switches he... between different zoom lenses as well. So it would have to kind of rotate. Yeah, with, with the FLIR, when you look at it, it's got all these different lenses on it. And, mm -hmm. and a lot of times when you're seeing that movement, it's just the flared part itself actually just adjusting to the next uh, lens. Um, and then, of course, if he's flipping through those different modes that, that fast, you will see like a, a distortion between each time he moves it to a different mode because the, the actual physical pod has to move to a different lens. Um, it, except for when I think it's thermal to optical. Yeah, I think that that's all through the same the same camera, but I'd have to I'd have to go back and look at it. But it's um, well, whenever you look at these flare pods, they're just round pods. Yeah, you know, and on 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 the F 18s they almost kind of look like a little little missile with like a little uh, camera thing at the end of it, and you know it, it it can move in multiple directions. Looking at the actual video that you guys got to see, it's looks like it was compressed horribly. Mm -hmm. That it was like basically made for like, hey, check this out, like through an email back then, because it would have been small enough to fit in an email. So it it, it kind of really just looks like somebody just compressed it to send to a regular like Gmail or Yahoo account. So you watched the the original video. Did you watch it like as it happened? Was it like a live feed? I can't say yes because I was only under the impression that it was a live feed. Um, there's some question whether we had the capabilities to do a live feed mm -hmm. at the time. Um, I haven't been able to validate that it was live, but I can say that it was within, it had to have been within hours. Um, cause I mean, at a, at a certain point it was no longer on the secret drive anymore. Cause I remember we watched it all the way through to the end and then the camera flips off as the jet's landing and then it disappears for probably about maybe a minute and then you're able to actually go back and from the beginning and play it again. Mm. But it wasn't until it was, you know, because it, it was loading onto the server as, as we were watching it. So I, I was just uh, under the impression because of what people were saying at the time, because somebody had grabbed me and said, Hey, they're doing the intercept. Let's go watch it. And I'm like, okay. what do you mean watch it? You know, he goes, well, it's on the secret. It's, it's on the secret land. So let's go take a look at it. So they, they, you know, so you were actually watching it later? That's for, I don't know. I'd be dead honest with you. If I, yeah. if I had been smart at the time and wrote down times and stuff like that, I could have definitely correlated that better. But you remember early 20s, 15 years ago, I, I honestly don't remember the time frame. Yeah. Is, you know, I know now exactly when they did the intercepts, but I couldn't tell you when I actually watched it. That's why I, I, I won't validate whether I, can, whether I saw it live or not. I was just under the impression that it was. Yeah, no, I could see. Yeah, and that would be kind of exciting. So, could could you like like characterize like what what's the the big differences between what you saw and and what's there now? Like obviously it it, it was like higher resolution, but what could you see about the objects that you you can't see in the video that's out there now? Well, at one at one point, when he's flipping through the cameras, he kind of kind of zooms in on the the object. And you can see its definite outline and shape, the tic-tac shape. You can see the uh, it's in the regular camera mode, so you're not seeing the flare uh, light up, but okay. you're actually seeing its actual, you know, it's got like a phosphorescence to it. But like, that's kind of a wrong word for it because like, all right, so if you think like a, a regular light bulb that has a phosphorescence, but mm -hmm. like say a, a frosted cover, Right. It generally kind of starts really, really bright on the center and then gets a little lighter as it goes out. Yeah. Or this would be one uniform color throughout all of the area that you're seeing. It didn't have like a, a bright center. It was just all this all the same brightness. In the video, it's it's dark. Now, once it goes to the FLIR, it's almost it's almost like a negative look to it. 
and it goes dark. And so that's hmm. it, that happens with a lot of jets and stuff. When you look at a, a lot of flare photography, uh, the the images go dark and the actual flare. But when you go to the actual, you can they lighten up. So the like in the in the video that's on the internet right now, you you see it. Uh, it shows the two modes. That it says IR for the infrared, mm -hmm. which is the the flare forward looking infrared. And it yeah. says TV, which is the uh, the visible light version. Yeah. But in the TV mode, it's still dark as well. I think it's due to the poor resolution. Um, because when, hmm. when we saw it, it, even though the craft itself was dark, you could tell that it was still emanating a light, and you could still you could see the actual outline of it. You could see that there was some type of appendages at the bottom. That's very um, interesting. I couldn't t I couldn't tell you like exactly what the appendages looked like. But you could tell that there was something protruding from it. Um, every, but other than those, everything else looked completely smooth. Yeah, that's that's really interesting. Though, like like you're saying that it, it was light in that video, but in the the video we have now, it looks dark. It's kind of like um, trying to figure out how ever, that could be. Well, have you ever back in VHS days recorded something and then re-recorded it and re-recorded it and then uh -huh. recorded just too many times or right, right. photocopy too many times? Yeah. I got a feeling that this tape, this, the, the version that we got, was, had had a been recopied quite a few times before it was ever sent digital. Hmm. Hmm. Have you ever tried to like draw a picture of what you've seen? Um. I haven't, but I know a lot of people have. <laughs> for me, for me, it was a, a, the the what I saw was a bit irrelevant uh, to what it could do, and so uh, I've always just been trying to figure out exactly how it worked. So it really was never really important for me to draw it because the the depictions that I've seen of it already are are close enough to being accurate to what I saw. Now, if you take even the garbage film that they released and you speed it up and you loop it, you can start seeing the way the things, the way the thing actually moves. There's a, there was somebody that told me that they actually did it, and it swears to God that it actually changed shape a little bit. And it mm. very well could be, but I would like to get a, a better copy of it and do that. But with such a small amount of film. I don't know how accurate that would be. So you so saying might be something that might be something you, you might it, want to try to do. When you saw it change shape or in, in the, no, the video that's out there now. That somebody's reported to me that that's what he told me that he did is he took it from the very moment that it started to accelerate in uh -huh. the film itself to the very last moment you see it in last frame and he broke it uh -huh. down to uh whatever's smaller than the frames. Um, I don't know anything about film, filmography or anything like that. So uh, he said he could break it down to like even subframes, like even smaller, and yeah, then a... loop it, and then he can actually and then speed it up, the film up to see, you know, more specifically yeah. movement of the object. So if if you have that type of skill set, you could probably try that and get a better idea of like what it looked like i do but i think a lot of times when people do things like that they they're kind of adding things to the film that aren't actually there unintentionally because uh there really isn't very much information i mean you've seen the, the no, video yeah that's you know and that's a lot of the problem that's why yeah. that's why it's like for me i'm surprised that this is taken off because it's such a i mean it is an outstanding story but it is. But it's, it's, I mean, the story itself is pretty benign. You know, okay, I saw these objects. They did some crazy things. They were solid. I know that they were solid. We had eyes on them. We've seen the shape. We have a video. You know, I got to see a much better video, but I don't expect anybody to just believe me that, I, that we were able to see that. The only thing I have is collaboration. And generally, I'd say 80% of all of our stories are almost dead on exact, which generally only happens if the event actually does happen you know and i only believe about 20 percent of what everybody says anyways <laughs> <laughs> yeah so you certainly like you got a lot of people telling the same story about the radar and yeah having these 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 radar returns and uh having them thinking that they are craft but you've only got like the two people you got fravor uh fravor and uh the female pilot is anonymous but she appeared in one of the tv shows 
giving the actual accounts of of the movement. Are there other people who actually saw the craft itself besides those two? Um, from what I from what I understand, that the the people that were up in the Hawkeye at the time actually were able to see this thing right out of their port window. That the thing had gotten close enough that they could see in every detail of this mm. the, of the ship, even close. They they were the probably the closest eyewitnesses in the entire event. But none of them have um, come forward, though, have they? No, none of them have actually well, said. That's the weird thing about this. They're the only ones that had to sign a non-disclosure. Everybody aboard that plane had to sign a non-disclosure. Now, I've only counted this for two things. Either they saw something we all didn't and aren't allowed to talk about it, like uh, ship identification or an ability or, you know, because they have a lot of passive devices on that, on that, on that bird that we, that can listen to different, different frequencies of RF, different, you know, IR frequencies, different, um, you know, they, they've got, all these passive systems just constantly collecting butt tons of data about the battlefield. Yeah, I mean, it's a, it's there's a reason we call it our eyes in the sky. Um, yeah, yeah. So the, but, the, uh, the the Hawkeye, just for people who don't know, is like one of the these radar planes that has a big uh, radar uh, radar on the top of the plane, and it gives very good uh, radar coverage over a wide area. Yeah. So uh, yeah, I'm a, a bit of a skeptic. Uh, I, I run like debunking websites. You a skeptic? <laughs> no way. Wait, wait, wait a minute. I'm on a skeptic show. How yeah, did I that happen? <laughs> guess your agents uh, <laughs> put the wrong the wrong show. <laughs> yeah, and I, I I don't care whose show I go on, man. I I saw what I saw. It's not going to change. It's no, I, I I don't doubt you know I, what you what you saw at all. Basically, I ain't got a dog in a race whether you believe me or not. So it's it's you know it's I do believe you. My I do believe you. But yeah, I guess like my skeptic point of view is that yeah. you know, people saw what they saw, but that it was not what they ended up thinking that it was. Yeah, and I've got so many different theories from the most mm-hmm. wild, benign theories, but most of my theories are based in at least a grain of scientific truth. Like it, it, like it could happen if X, Y, and Z are true, then this could definitely happen. Right. If this hypothesis under quantum mechanics is true, then this could happen. You know, so I basically started with, you know, the, the, the end product and worked my way back along a lot of different pathways. It's just to kind of, you know, and sometimes it's just fun to do the wild ideas, you know? Yeah. And, you know, to be honest with you, a lot of people don't even want to hear about my benign ideas. You know, <laughs> you say you're like you 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 have benign ideas about you know what this craft actually was, but like, just is it possible to even dial it back a little bit more than that and ask you know how how absolutely convinced are you that the radar returns actually showed an actual craft? I'm a hundred percent sure about that. And that's, that's about one of the few things that I can honestly say that these were actual solid tracks. Um, so initially knowing the, knowing the system, the well, as well as I do, it, it'd be like saying, uh, I don't know. Yeah. If you're looking at a rainbow, you know, what's the chances of it's actually diffused light through, through a cloud, you know, it, Right. It's a it's it's a hundred percent chance yeah, yeah, that yeah. it is, you know, or somebody could be, you know, just artificially making one. There just, could be high level tech that we couldn't, but either way, even if it's high level tech spoofing a system that is ridiculously hard to yeah. spoof, that's still amazing. <laughs> so even if you're right and this is something else, it's still amazing that they could do it. And well, it's still a technology that's far beyond anything that we have on the field yeah i guess my most my most banal explanation if i'm like you're making a list of possible explanations the most banal one is that it is faulty radar returns from something like uh, cirrus clouds like Mm -hmm. high altitude ice clouds and i know kevin day said that at some point the captain suggested that it might be ice no it was a it was a cover story at the end just to try to try to throw people off and it was kind of an after the fact half uh, baked thought from one person on the ship that kind of caught on yeah um uh, and think- it's uh they called it spontaneously forming ice in the atmosphere now if 
All right, so ice is pretty dense and would mm-hmm. definitely give us a return. But generally, uh, an object that large full of ice, if it was a piece of ice that large, it, it wouldn't be able to stay aloft. I mean, it just honestly, it would yeah, have yeah. way too much mass. Well, yeah, I wouldn't imagine a big ice cube falling out of the sky. I mean, you would have to have a ridiculous subtract just to keep it mm-hmm. even from... Yeah, you know, dro- but it would only drop as fast as gravity would pull it. Right. What 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 it suggests to me, and uh, is that it would be clouds rather than than you know falling ice, a big big block of ice. Like because mm-hmm. we you talk about it being at twenty eight thousand feet, which is in the range of cirrus clouds, and mm-hmm. it's moving south ish. Uh, I'm not sure the exact 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 heading that they had, and at about one hundred and fifteen miles an hour, about about hundred knots. Which is about the speed of the wind up there. Yeah. Now, um, I would say I would say you might be onto something, but I've seen serious clouds on the spy, and mm-hmm. I've seen serious clouds when they actually have ice crystals in them, and basically it looks like a disrupt. Like you'll see the entire radar screen. It looked like a uh, a disrupted pattern. You won't see any one solid track. What right. you see is small, these small kind of wisps. And our system would immediately say, okay, well, that's not a solid track. And it would literally just erase them from the screen. Mm-hmm. Because uh, so e- even if there were huge solid objects, you know, like say it was sp- spontaneously forming ice crystals, and say they weren't a big, huge block and they were just small crystals that could keep on an updraft you would still just see a very ever shifting it would wouldn't be one solid track you know it wouldn't be because the entire cloud itself is going to take up a lot more space than an f-18 yeah you know and so So, you know logic just logically thinking through that right say say we are tracking that cloud that cloud is going to immediately look like clutter and then our radar will clean it up and then only we'll only see the more solid parts of it, which would be mm-hmm. the most dense portions that have ice in them. And then once it realizes that those are just sporadic, because they're going to move around, they're not going to be, you know, in just one little circle. Because once they got dense enough, they just fall. Right, but I wasn't really thinking so much about uh, tracking a cloud, as in tracking the whole cloud as as an object, mm-hmm. uh, more as a kind of like an optical RF. Uh, not not optical, obviously, but RF um, type thing where the ice crystals are arranged in such a way that it reflects the radar beam in in a certain way. Now you know, like coronas and halos. Now that would work if, like, you were talking about like a you know a police radar. Yeah, you know, like right. a police radar, it it will you know fog affects it, weather conditions affect it, so you know you can get out of your ticket that way. Mm-hmm. <laughs> But with this system, we're pumping so much power out that that cloud doesn't stand a chance. We're, we're, we're just we, we we could probably burn straight through it. You if you if you took a turkey and you put it on the outside of the, that array, it would cook the turkey. Hmm. I mean, we're talking. This is a very powerful radar. Okay. Um, I mean. I don't think it could change weather conditions, but I can guarantee that a, a cloud full of ice wouldn't really be a problem for it. So I guess like the problem here is that you know, the the precise technical details of the the spy radar are uh, like classified. Yeah, they, uh, they are classified, but I can tell you that any type of cloud on this planet doesn't pose right. a problem for this radar, whether it has full of ice. And the only thing that would stop it is if there was literally a plane inside the cloud. All right. Well, suppose like I, I, I hear what you're saying there. How how would I personally go about verifying that though? Like I hear you saying it, and you know, obviously Navy I trust, and trust a you. Join the Navy Bravo technician. <laughs> um, <laughs> or become like, an Aegis technician. That's about the only way you would ever be able to know. Is 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 it something that would essentially be covered by you know secrecy and that uh, I wouldn't be able to get an answer if I went looking um, for it? Because I've tried tried looking up technical specifications and you know trying to find like papers on. You might clutter. have better luck looking for training manuals. Mm. 
you know, so like look for Aegis training command uh, manuals, you know, especially for the older baselines that are maybe not as classified anymore. Because like, so the spy has been around since baseline one, but it wasn't one Bravo. It wasn't, I mean, one Bravo ended up being, a, a, you know, the upgraded version of the original. One. And then of course, you know, it's just gone, gotten even, even more crazy since then. Yeah. Um, but it, uh, yeah. Yeah, so I mean, I guess what I'm doing is like I'm looking at how do we actually eliminate this possibility? Now, you know, well, you, you only have system experts. Yeah, I mean, and yeah, we've got we've got you, uh, but and you're telling me that it, it yeah, that it's impossible that a serious cloud could do it. But you know, the skeptic in me wants to actually have something you know written down or something that actually verifies what you're saying. All right, so we'll start with like a like a forty nine radar, which is a which is a parabolic dish radar. Yeah, uh, go find a specifications for FCS illuminators, because the FCS illuminator, or just any type of illuminator, which is basically just a uh, a dish that shoots an, an RF beam. Um, if you go look up the specifications on that and see what they will do to a cloud, then you can mm -hmm. kind of extrapolate, because Spy One Bravo is the most powerful radar on the planet. So I wonder, like, um, yeah, the, the 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 spy radar is obviously it's it's military application. It's not not like a weather thing. So it's not designed to look at the weather. It's designed to detect incoming it's, missiles and track it's planes and things just like that. To see solid objects, right. anything that's translucent or not a uh, not a not a solid, because it, it it uses algorithms to figure mm -hmm. out what things are. So, like, say, like I said, you know, once it sees solidness inside of a cloud, it filters it out because it's not an actual solid track. Right. Yeah, it sees the shift. It sees, you know, the fact that all these ice crystals are moving around. It's not a, it'd be like the difference if you, if, if I took a handful of sand and I, and I ran it across your eyes, you'd know that it was sand moving across your eyes and not a solid sheet of paper or a solid mm -hmm. sheet of rock. But now, if I took that same sand and I and I dumped it in a massive tub, it's still sand. But now, if you're not, if your if your perception is just dead on, looking straight forward, you know something's moving there, but you're not sure if it's solid. All right. Yeah. Now, what Spy can do is it can say it can see all these individual grains, hmm. and say no, these are all different things. It's not. Uh, there's no solid track there. Ignore that. Move forward. All right. Well, I guess I'll have to try to do some more digging then and try to figure out because, you know, what I want to do is try to eliminate possibilities. Yeah. Look at, look at, look up uh, maybe Aegis computer tech manuals. Like my NEC was 1144. So if mm -hmm. you can find up an old 1144 uh, Aegis computer manual, you know, maybe a training guide of some type, uh, if it's non classified, you should be able to find it. With the the display of the the spy radar that you saw, is is that something that somebody could now draw a picture of what that looked like without it being classified? Um, all right, picture the standard radar. I mean, I, could you recreate what you saw like visually? Could you actually like you know go into Photoshop and make something so so you could like say you know this is what uh, Cirrus clutter looks like. This is I'm sure Kevin could. I mean, he saw those damn things yeah. so much. Um, think of an 80s style computer game with a radar, right? Yeah, you know, I mean, it, it, it's it pretty much looks that you know the nice heavy pixels. Uh, you know, you're seeing a a you know they were LCD monitors, mm -hmm. so I mean they were they were at least had a little bit of detail to the track, so the track yeah. would be a would be a would be a triangle, you know, and it would be, it would have definition. Um, but uh, I'm not you know I didn't have to stare at the things for hundreds of hours, so you know. I was just a lucky little up there saying, "Hey, what does this mean? Hey, what does that mean?" Yeah, yeah. I guess I should talk to Kevin because uh, what I'd really like to do is try to try to you know I'm trying to eliminate possibilities, and so yeah, what no would be, be good is to get these pictures of why you were so convinced that there was a real track. You know, what does a yeah. a false track look like, and what are these faint tracks, and what are the strong tracks? Can we draw it with a in Photoshop? Well, it basically, what a, what like a faint track would look like is like imagine an aircraft moving along it comes and goes but then doesn't stay there uh 
and then it might come and go again and not stay there and then it just disappears and it's gone that would be clutter Mm -hmm. that would be just a ghost track that'd be just something that 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 would be like something that seems solid for a couple of seconds at a time but i mean it would be it would be sometimes they're just that quick though they're just you know and then okay they're just gone now with these they would pop up they would go in that bearing for crazy amounts of time hours and hours and where if it was like a ghost track or if it was clutter they wouldn't stay solid they wouldn't you you wouldn't see the track consistently for long periods of time the system would automatically try Mm. to determine whether it was clutter or not and it would basically blank it out and then it would come back as it got more solid blank it out and then it would come back as it was if it was more solid but now once we did recalibrations, these things just popped in absolutely solid and they just stayed there until they decided to leave. So you were tracking a single object for several hours, like the same object? Well, several objects, you know, there was between three and 10 at any given time. So and then they could have been the same ones over and over again. Like there could have only been 10 and then we were only seeing the same objects of those 10 over and over again. So after, after you've been tracking an object for hours, how does it, how does it end? How does it, how do you stop tracking it? Does it fly away? It, just, it, it either goes out of our range or goes faster than our radar can track. Those are the only two options. Do you know what speed that would be faster than the radar? I would track? have to look it up and I'm actually pretty sure that that's actually still classified. Okay. <laughs> but I will say that the system can track, uh, there's, there's a, there was a hypersonic missile that or a, uh, uh, and a mock. I, I can't remember what mock number, but it was a faster than sound missile that the Russians came up with. Mm-hmm. And the sea whiz that uses also a phase array radar, and the Spy One Bravo can actually track that mock at real time. So basically, think of a, like a, the, where we were talking about the parabolic dishes. You're not uh-huh. tracking at real time. You're tracking an echo of real time. But there so is a we, limit, we, though. There's a limit. And it, it was very, very, very fast. Because that number is still classified, no matter how you <laughs> re-say it. <laughs> but if it was if these objects were going that fast, wouldn't that immediately raise concerns with uh, you know the captain? Well, they didn't move that fast until after the interrogations, which is exactly why I said after we did the interrogation. So, like on the first day when you were you're tracking them on the first day before the interrogation, did they just drift off? When they fall off the radar, when they get down by San Clemente, where he said that they would all fall off. When they fall off, you don't worry about them. Anymore. They're gone. Okay. They're not within our realm of influence anymore. So before the interrogation, they never did any extreme maneuvers. Exactly. Anytime they appeared, they'd just be doing this okay. whole drift south thing at a hundred knots or so. And not like I said, it was very non threatening. Mm-hmm. I, I don't think I ever felt like I was ever in danger and I knew what was going on. But then again, I also trusted my chain of command yeah. too. So, and they weren't really stressing about it. So I wasn't yeah. stressing about it. Yeah, well, I guess if there's just you know something drifting off in the distance, it doesn't sound that bad. But when when it, after the interrogation, you know, Freya comes back, gives these reports. The other pilot comes back with a a video, and then you you start to see on the radar, uh, it doing extreme maneuvers like dropping out of the sky, like Kevin says it. Uh, it was dropping from 28,000 feet to 500 feet in a fraction of a second, things like that. So yeah. And, you know, very, we very could fast. actually track them going that fast. So that was what was kind of blowing people's minds. The fact that they could go from such an altitude down with a, you know, I mean, the friction involved would be tremendous. The, it would, the, yeah. the amount of G's that would be pushed onto a, a, a subject within the objects would be tremendous. And it should have broke the sound barrier several times on its way down. It, I think, I think it was like 0. 0.7 seconds when they yeah. finally figured out exactly how fast it was going, like how fast it went that distance. Yeah, I think Kevin said he replayed the data and he measured it. Yeah, that replay. and uh, right before it was <laughs> wiped from all the drives, poor guy. It was funny as when I was hearing him tell the story for the first time, and I'm thinking to myself, 
Yeah. I know exactly when you did that because it was right before I wiped all the drives. <laughs> so, so after that, was there uh, a change in the ship? Like after you had the interrogation and you start to see these things extreme got a maneuvers? More uptight. Yeah, things got a little bit more uptight. Nobody really wanted to talk about it. It was, uh, you know, just a, a running joke again. And it was like they were trying to blow it off. So after the interrogation, were you still seeing them? Um, after the interrogation, I didn't hear anything about them seeing them anymore. I think after the interrogation, they all bugged out. But I, I don't know okay. for sure. It just, you know, it's like once, once the party stops, you know, and you go home, you're not going to call back and say, hey, is the party still going on? You know, <laughs> you know I had already said, all right, cool. We saw, you know, I saw this video. I saw, right, I see right. these things over a week. And it's like, I, I've seen everything I needed to see. If there's something new, you know, tell me if it buzzes the ship because I want to go out and look at it, <laughs> you know. But other than that, I didn't hear anything past that. We went, we went into port after that. Okay. Um... But I'm just like trying to get the timeline straight here because, like you said, like before the interrogation, you didn't see them doing any extreme maneuvers on the radar, and then after the interrogation, you didn't see them. So, at what point was 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 Kevin observing these extreme dropping out of the sky? Type it was maneuvers? during it would be during the day when they had okay. the 18 interrogations. That's when they started kind of doing these crazy maneuvers, you know, going from very high altitudes to sea level in less than seven seconds, you know, point seven seconds. And, um, you know, it, like in the film, in the original film, you see the thing just, you know, moving uh, at, tr you know, tremendous speeds, you know, it speeds that take your eyes a second to realize that it's even moving. And then once you do realize you're moving, you know, it was moving, but it's still like, wow, I, I didn't even like, it, there's your perception just isn't there did you see a like more film besides the whatever it is like you know one minute that's that's out there now well the film the film that we saw was roughly uh, i think right around between eight and 12 minutes or so mm -hmm. uh if i had to like make a solid guess about 10 minutes long and then you know a lot of it was just you know kind of garbage there really wasn't right. much on it but then you know and then, then you saw this thing come into frame. You saw the 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 part that you guys see, and then after that, you see this thing bug out and then come back, and bug out and then come back. And it's always doing like right turns. Um, it, it, it's it's you know its velocities are are changing without changing changing speeds. You know, mm -hmm. it's not it's not like slowing down to take a turn. It's just turning and that in my brain broke See, my brain you, you saw this on the video this doing yes. turns yes you hmm. can see it doing turns in the video i'm just wondering how what you were actually seeing there though because like it's really zoomed in on the video so it's about one degree field of view so you're not you're not seeing how how but how could you tell it he was does, turning he, pull, he, pull, he pulls uh towards the end of the film he does pull back because he's having a hard time keeping it in the frame All right um at in least what you saw. That, yeah it, that's at least that's my interpretation like you know so if i was sitting there filming that and because it kept it kind of kept dipping out of the frame and it looked like he was having a hard time keeping it in the frame right. um because it kept mm -hmm. moving kind of drifting off out of the frame and then so he went to a more wide look to of it so it would be just a an object in the middle and then you would probably have uh, from what you guys saw, probably about ten times the field of view. Then you know, you have ten times the space around it that okay. you would have seen. Uh, so you're not seeing the detail that you would have seen in the original, like in the first portion of it. But you're going to see its flight mechanics a lot more. Um, and I think could he use, probably did that on purpose because of what it was doing. Could you see clouds in the background and and water? No. Not really. Um, so it's just all just gray background, and you see the black dots yeah. in the middle. Yeah. So hmm. it was just it was just the ship that he was tracking and him flying, and you could tell like when he would, you know, raise his nose, you could see, uh, you know, because it, it was a it was it was from what I understand a clear day. 
So there wouldn't have been too many clouds anyways. But I've gotten conflicting reports about yeah. that. You got to remember that for the most part during this whole the whole interrogation and everything, I would have been inside the skin of the ship. All right, yeah. So I really don't remember what the weather was like that day. Yeah. Just if there's no clouds or water, you can't really tell whether it's the camera moving or it's the object moving. So it's hard to, to know that it's actually making moves because it could be just he's mo- moving the camera from uh, one side to the other. That, that could be true. I, I, I can give you, I can give you at least that one. But mm. uh, with the way the, those pods are, I don't really think that that would have really worked that way. Um, Cause you got, I got to, you also got to remember, we can actually see the bearing of the, of the actual plane itself. Yeah. That, that wouldn't change when the camera's moving though. I mean, I'm not saying that the jet itself is moving. I'm just saying that the camera's moving you, yeah, the jets here and the camera's like, you know, underneath it. Yeah. So it's uh, but the, ca- yeah. the camera would have moved to move with the, with the craft, it, you know, it, it would have been tracking the craft itself. So it would have been moving with the craft. And so, it, you know, unless the jet moved, then you would kind of get that effect like what you're talking about. Well, the camera would still move to track the craft in that case, though, even if the jet moves, because the jet moves and the camera stays. It, it, the, the, it would only move if it lost lock. But now also the, the camera wouldn't be janky. It wouldn't, it wouldn't just be jagged, though. No. It would just be a smooth move as it moves. Yeah. So if, say, so, so the camera moving and then the jet and then the object moving in an irregular matter, it, it's still, you know, the camera's not bouncing or anything like that. It's but just moving smooth. It's the thing, though. If the camera is locked on to the object, then the camera is going to be tracking this object uh, no matter which way it moves up down left, left or right. right so uh how would you how would you know the object was moving it would have to move out of the actual frame which means that the frame had lost track the system itself it would actually move with the object mm-hmm. so so you wouldn't be able to see it moving if it was moving you, but you could tell if it was like a janky move like what you're talking about like so if it was like uh you know if the camera was 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 moving at a fast rate, which it, they don't. They just move at the rate that they need, and it's a very smooth movement. Um, if you look up a video of, of like, uh, just look up like a, a, you know, the manufacturer's video of of it. They have a video of how it moves and everything like that. And you'll see how smooth that thing actually moves. And I, I'm not sure that you would really see the effect that you're talking about. Mm. Like that. Yeah, it's just if there's no background, you can't really see that. And if it moves out of the out of the targeting area, that means it's actually lost track, which could be a camera movement rather than the actual object movement. I'd have to replicate it, but yeah. um, I, th- I think with the way that that object did move, just because it's not going to generate a right turn. You know, you couldn't generate a right turn at a constant velocity or a left turn at a constant velocity. I mean, unless the jet was literally turning on its axis while the camera was moving. Mm. So then, yeah. like, you know, so you see what I mean, though? Like, all right, so if you, you were watching it, yeah, you could see it could look like it's speeding out of the frame and in and out of the frame or going up and down or doing weird things like that. But while it's still within the frame, you could see it taking these right turns and these left turns at 90 degree angles at the same yeah. and not, and not slowing down. So it's within good. the actual frame, you could see that. Having a hard time uh, visualizing that, but uh, <laughs> I guess that's something we could, okay. uh, yeah. All right. So, all right. So what I want you to picture, all right. Mm-hmm. So you're, you're sitting in a cockpit, you're looking at your, your camera. All right. Okay. And you, so you set it to start tracking this. All right? Okay. So you flip through your cameras and you, okay, you see it. All right. So now you start moving it around to try to get a better, better, you know, you flip through the different cameras. You're trying to find it. You know, you want to make sure that you get as much film in different versions as possible so that mm-hmm. you can get as much information. You're looking for jet wash. You're looking for, you know, anything that could be identifying on how it's staying in the air. You can, you know, you, so that's actually the purpose of flipping it through all the different films. All right. So if there's like a jet a, a jet flume, you know, once you hit the thermal, you'll be able to see a jet flume. You know, if you if you you know, infrared, you'll be able to see heat signatures. You'll be able to see if there is a hot spot somewhere, so there could be an engine. 
you know, those, those, the, that would be the, the reason why he would be flipping it through. And then he settles on whatever he sees. He can see the best detail. Mm-hmm. And then from there, you see him and he starts zooming in and out. He's trying to look for that, that, that sweet spot. So he hits that sweet spot. All right. So now it, it's generally not doing a whole lot at that point. So he's able to actually do all of this stuff manually. And then all of a sudden it starts to move along with the jet and and things. So you start moving it to try to follow and it doesn't work. And that's when you can kind of see the camera move and it just kind of moves off off. And then he goes more towards a wide, you know, then he zooms back in so that it's more of a wide angle. And you can actually see it now moving around. And at certain points you can see it do like a right turn within the frame itself not like going off the frame or or, Mm -hmm. you know so within the actual field of vision of the camera you can see it do a right turn at constant velocity you can see it do left turns at constant velocity you can see it move in in patterns like like in circular patterns and ovals and things like that without changing any velocities and they were such tight patterns that Hmm. You know, yeah, I can imagine I, 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 no, I really have to see like, it though. It's, it's it, hard to it visualize be, well, how modern, you could tell that. In a modern vehicle, you would be basically, yeah. you know, mush on the side of that that, that vessel. Yeah, yeah. Your so, brain could handle that kind of pressure. So, what what do you think it actually was? What's your number one hypothesis? Very advanced technology. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, basically, all right. So, I honestly think that it was. An actual physical object. Uh-huh. I think it was a, a very, a very advanced piece of technology. Am I convinced of anything alien? No, not really. Mm-hmm. Um, and honestly, until an alien lands on my lawn or I meet him and shake his hand, then you know, I'll, I'll, I'll pose the idea that it is plausible because I'm a big fan of Drake and Drake's equation and the fact that you know, to think that there's no other life in the absolute universe, I, you know, I, I can concede that yes, there. There definitely is life in the rest of the universe. Yeah. We've proved we've proven that just with comets. Comets hold the all building blocks of life. You know, right. they're basically right. uh, you know, nature's life giver for a you know garbage planet of a rock. <laughs> you know, okay, here we go. Here's all the basic building blocks. Here's all your amino acids. Here's your you know, here's all, all of your proteins so that you can start single cell organisms. <laughs> you know, so it's uh yeah, it's it's it, for there not to be life somewhere else now plausibly within range now i uh kevin newth i just listened to uh one of his lectures and he's a little bit more down to earth i do a lot of things say he basically generally was talking about you know if there was another civilization and they didn't have fast light travel which is most likely which is something that i actually think too that if we did get visited by them and I don't think it was a permanent trip. I don't, I think it was, these people would have to be a set of people that are nomadic. They have to be consistently moving and they're never going to go back to their home world. Because by the time they get back to their home world, it's, you know, a hundred thousand years in the yeah. future. You know what I mean? Everyone's so, dead. Yeah, exactly. You know, even if they come back here, you know, shit, everything's extinct. That was here <laughs> the last time they were here. You know, they're, they're dealing with geologic time, but in their, in their realm there, it's only been eight months, <laughs> you know, so, you know, cause of that love, uh, lovely time dilation problem. Yeah. And so as you can tell, I do got a decent grasp of physics. Yeah. Um, no, so, uh... well, so his idea it generally says that, you know, if they, if they are these people, that would explain why a lot of the similar crafts, a lot of the similar, you know, shapes or hmm. these just could be just things left behind by them for all i know but most likely you know we could have had a, a cartel on technology since the 40s you know i mean with uh you know the, you know vanderbilts and you know all this big money it's a box. they did it with the oil industry they did it with the diamond industry why didn't why wouldn't they do it with the technology industry hmm. and so if we had this crazy advanced technology and i mean it may be on a world platform where there's actually a level of black market that countries deal in black market technology like this, who knows? The so, average uh, 
oil and diamonds are not like secret commodities, though. Are, are you yeah, suggesting but, this? But, but then again, you can you can stumble across a diamond and you can stumble across oil, but you can't stumble across an advanced piece of technology. <laughs> yeah. Not, do you not, do you think not that easily at least? Uh, you, know? you know, if if they've got this 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 cartel idea you're talking about with keeping this advanced technology, are you is are you saying that they are using the technology for something else, or are they actually incorporating it gradually into human society? I think as they can profit, or as as I mean, it's not a very it's not a very far fetched idea that people would hold back something to make yeah, a bigger sure. profit. You know, I mean. It's been happening since, you know, the beginning of time, you know, hey, I got a bronze axe, you know, I can make bronze axes for you, but, you know, it's costly. And then you <laughs> find out that it's not that costly. And, you know, now 18 guys can do it. Now the cost goes down. You know, so, I mean, it's the same cycle all the way around. You know, they make a yeah. little blue pill that allows you to enjoy your life all the way through <laughs> to the end. Then all of a sudden, 10 years later, everybody can make the pill, yeah. <laughs> you know, so. <laughs> You know, so I mean, it's 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 the same thing. You know, I mean, we we know of chemicals that retard the growth of tumors, but they're tied up in a lot mm. of bureaucracy. You know, we know of all kinds of tech that's just basically sitting around waiting to be completely proven. Yeah, they say there's cars that can run on water. I don't believe uh, them, yep. but they, they do uh, say well, that. <laughs> well, what it is is uh, those are hydrogen cell cars. They use osmosis. That's it. It's a simple thing. They basically just take water. They separate the hydrogen from it. They use the hydrogen as a fuel cell, and then it spits out spits out oxygen. But you can, <laughs> it doesn't actually work though, because you you need the energy to split the hydrogen and the oxygen. Well, that's just it. It would. Uh, once I mean, it's I mean, even even a combustion engine isn't efficient. Mm -hmm. You know, so yeah, so nobody said it was efficient. It's just that it would work. Yeah, well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, uh, so basically you would set this thing to, you know, the osmosis mode at night while you're sleeping to get enough hydrogen to go to work in the morning. Right. Well, it's like <laughs> plugging in your electric car, really, essentially. Yeah, you still got to use power. You know, it's, it's an energy you know, storage technique. Uh, yeah, exactly. You, it does like, work, but it's not as, as efficient. And it could be more efficient, and it could eventually work well. Um, the technology has come a long ways. Um, I mean, even look at look at the, some of the technology just in some of these uh, hybrid cars. You know, using even the therm the thermal uh, thermal coupling of the brakes to, to generate power. You know, they're they're trying to pull as much power as they can out of these things to regenerate. You know, to recharge the batteries as long as possible. Yeah, you know? it'd be interesting if there's actually some. UFO technology that's incorporated into current technology, like uh, you know, if, if this you know this big conspiracy is actually true, you could imagine that they would, you know, like like the iPhone gets a bit better every year. The cars get a little better every year, so you have to buy a new car, and so they're they're giving you a little bit more alien technology every yeah. year. Yeah. Now, even if it's not even alien technology, but if say 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 technically. Say in the 40s, they did pick up a craft. You know, they, they found some some weird technology. They don't know where it's from. And they start dinking with it in the 40s. Well, you know what these guys in the 40s would have done? They would have applied electricity to the boards or what they thought were boards. They would have tried to electrocute it. They would have tried to freeze it. They would have tried to catch it on fire. They would have tried to, say, you, know, do, you know, basically the crude forms of things because they didn't have an understanding of subatomic you know structures or uh or the you know even semiconductors would have been like yeah what like a modern I mean, computer what you, what you, what, yeah what do you mean you have an entire computer on a chip that, that, that's not real you know i mean everything's magic and everything's aliens until it's proven not to be <laughs> yeah. well uh tell me real quick about uh uap enterprises because we're kind of running right, out of so, time here Hey, we, we got a basically, uh, uh, you know, a ragtag group of people, and uh, we got some, you know, people like Kevin Newth and Deep and uh, Deep Facade, and you know, some really, really big brains that make me feel mm -hmm. stupid. <laughs> and uh, you know, what we're trying to do is, you know, figure out what these what these phenomena are. Um, primarily, our first task is we want to go back out to where we were at when we tracked these UAPs and. Uh, you know, since we've been doing, you know, a lot of digging in that area and, you know, as long as there's been humans there, they've been reporting these, these types of sightings. 
Um, and it goes back, you know, over a hundred years, you know, mm-hmm. and if you take into considering, you know, say 99.9% of these stories are absolutely a drunken sailor on a ship and somebody with a flashlight, <laughs> you know, something as simple as that, um, you know, even if 1% of the stories are true, there's something to it. You know, if you have a thousand unrelated people and, you know, a hundred of them see something odd and they all correlate, well, there's something to it. Maybe. Whether it's, well, so there's something. I suppose it's like whether it's more in one there. area gonna, than another. Not, yeah, you know. Yeah. I mean, it's we we're, we're we're finding that a lot of these stories are pretty dead on. You know, without and when we talk to these people, you know, we're not telling them anything about us or what we're looking for. You know, we're just asking them their story. Mm-hmm. You know, and, they, and most people are glad to tell it. And most yeah. people are reluctant to tell it. And, you know, you, you get all walks, you know, you get more reputable people and less reputable people. Mm-hmm. Um, I wish we could have all, you know, PhDs and, you know, military guys, <laughs> you know, people that at least have been vetted with a background. You know, if you have a top secret clearance, at least we know you're not insane because you have to do a psyche valve. <laughs> so well. it's, you know, it's, 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 there's at least a small bit of criteria that you can go on, you know, so. So you're actually working on a project now at the UAP? Yeah, um, we're we're working on. Uh, we've got uh, ships set up set up to be chartered. We got technology set up to be used to uh, check everything from EM fields to environmental data. Uh, you know, uh, analysis of the actual water in the area. You know, we're trying to mm. keep every stone up, turn every stone. You know, so in our group ranges everybody from you know guys like me that are nuts and bolts and more you know more pragmatic to guys that you know this was you know a life-changing thing that happened to them that you know they they are were spiritually moved by this too Mm -hmm. you know and uh i'd make more fun of that if i hadn't started really reading into quantum mechanics and as you read deeper and deeper into these these newer quantum mechanics these actual science that people are doing in quantum sciences in the quantum sciences it's borderline insane (laughs) i mean you know i mean basically do physics without time or distance yeah and see what you get and i mean that's basically what they're saying is that basically time at the quantum scale doesn't doesn't matter and distance doesn't matter because every single particle in the entire universe is quantum entangled. Yeah, like interesting stuff. Yeah, wow. it's, it, it hurts my head half the time, but it's <laughs> it, it's crazy interesting. Yeah. Um, well, do you have any questions for me, specific direct questions? Because I want to make sure that, you know, and I've tried to be as honest as I can. If I don't know something, I don't know it. And I do apologize about that. And I tried to keep my... Uh, my opinions to a minimum. Yeah, no, I, I really appreciate your, your, everything you told me. Uh, I think like the, the difficulty really is in you know making a case that doesn't just simply rely upon you know this eyewitness testimony and talking about things like you know, you you uh, telling me that it couldn't possibly be a, a, you know, a serious cloud or something like that. And yeah, you know, I think what I would like to do as the next step is try to nail that down. And right. get, so, uh, like I said, I, I hope I've something. given you at least a couple of leads to yeah, try to find yeah, some actual information on it. Um, yeah. Older baselines, so you you want to when you look at the spy data, you know, spy information, you might be able to find maybe you know training manuals on spy, spy radar technician training manuals mm-hmm. or, or yeah. uh, agency no, sure. computer technician training manuals. You know, I mean, even if they're really old, they'll give you an idea of what it can do. Yeah. You'll never find the information about how powerful it is, but it is very, very, very powerful. Oh, uh, so one thing I, be, one thing I thought rain? of whilst uh, you were talking about you know it being secret about how fast it can track things, uh, but you also told me that you can calculate how fast they dropped out of the sky, mm-hmm. and so that puts kind of like a, an, an upper limit a, can, on the speed that it can of, track. You can get a limit to it, but. Uh, it's it's we can track much faster than that even that yeah. and it's uh hmm. 
So that there again, I would like to I would like to see the specs on the on the yeah, sky. Yeah, so. I bet a lot of people would like to see those yeah, specs. Yeah, <laughs> the Russians, so, so the Russians, the Chinese. Yeah. You know, everybody that doesn't have Aegis technology. Um, yeah, I'll try the dark web. Hey, if you got access to it, go for it. Just remember, Snowden does live in Russia for a reason. Yes, yes, indeed. I'm reading his book at the moment. It's uh, interesting. Uh, but anyway, that's another topic. But anyway, Gary, uh, I'll let you get back to your family. And I want to thank you very much for taking the time to talk to me. And uh, if I've got some more questions, can I like you know follow up with you like on uh, on Twitter or? I keep I keep it. If, if you directly uh, PM me, I will yeah. answer any questions. Cool. It's Thank hard you very for me much. to keep track of all these. You know, yeah, no, you, yeah. you say I something, imagine. and everybody tells you you're an idiot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I, I get that a lot. <laughs> I, I, yeah, I understand where you're coming from. You're trying you're trying to get a grasp on it. You're trying to get you know an idea in mm. your own head and try to figure this out. What how it makes sense to you. And I, and I get that. And that's why I agreed to this, yeah. this podcast. And no, thank you know, you. If, I th- if I thought you were just out to, you know, crucify me, I, I wouldn't be here right now. I'd be like, yeah, the guy's a joke. You know, he, he, you know, he doesn't want to know anything. He's just here to be a dick, you know. But, you know, and then depending on how this comes out, well, that'll be, you know, I'll either defend you to the death or I'll, you know, basically say, well, he kind of hacked it. And uh, <laughs> that's not exactly what I said. Yeah, well, so yeah, believe you've me, got a, you know, I, you've I got a copy of I, this. I, you can uh, download it from Skype after we after we finish yeah. talking, and you can. Uh, I'm not even worried about it, man. Yeah. I uh, I don't pull my punches, <laughs> so it's either it's it's either all or nothing with me. Uh, either you stay yeah, up, no, you stay up, up with me. You're always there. Yeah. Period. Cool. Take it easy. All right. Have a good, good night. God bless okay. you. Thank God you. bless your family. You too. Bye.